All right, so uh, I didn't get the instructional, my copy of these uploaded, I'll do that after class. Um, but uh, I'm sorry that you don't have those to follow along with. A um, couple of reminders. So the uh, midterm scores are returned. So, uh, and there was like, there's sort of a tight curve. Um, both versions just a, a slight bit. So uh, you won't see that on the actual midterm, but if you look in your grades, you'll see midterm stage one, and then there'll be another sort of like funny assignment next to it, but it'll say like midterm stage one adjustment. And that's where the curve isn't applied. So your actual score is the midterm stage one and the adjustments added that those two things together form the category for the midterm score that gets put into your, your final grade. So I think at the bottom of your grades in Canvas, it shows like all the individual weighted categories. You should see one that says like midterm stage one and it's weighted for how many percent, whatever the, the division is. And that percentage there will be a combination of those two. So I basically added, um, I think 5% to stage one and two and a half percent to stage two. Um, and uh, just because there were, there were about two questions that um, I think on stage one that were, were more difficult than I expected. And um, the questions improved significantly on stage two, but uh, I still just wanted to, because uh, they, they, I think, probably required a little bit more thought um, than I was, I was hoping for that has added that extra correction to stage two as well. So any questions about that? Uh, anybody have any trouble seeing your scores? At least posted okay. okay. And because the midterm is another significant contribution to your score, that should buffer the estimates of your final scores. So your final score should start looking a little bit like more representative. Hopefully that's good. Um, other things is, of course, uh, next week is spring break. So, um, you know, we won't be meeting, but I initially planned that today was going to be a reading and today's lecture would be after spring break, but I decided I didn't want to give you a reading right after the midterm. So I flipped kind of that around, came up with a little bit different plan of what we're doing today. Uh, but if we're, the, so the plus side is there's no reading crammed into the same week as your, your midterm. The downside is then after spring break, uh, Tuesday and Thursday are both reading days. Um, but uh, those reading assignments are available. So you have, you know, you're welcome to start on them uh, now or over spring break and so on. So there will be um, two readings from the Resilience uh, book. And so those are posted and available, and I'll get the reading exercises up there real soon. So that's so that's the thing. So F two and F three after spring break are uh, readings online, and then there is a uh, muddiest point, just as usual for this week. Um, which will basically be just about um, today, although you can definitely reflect on the midterm as well if you would like. And I'll make that due this Sunday, but since it's spring break, I'll just make it available all through spring break. So I'm just going to get due on Sunday just so it's on the calendar as normal, but um, there's no need to, you know, if anybody's got travel plans or whatever, then I'll just make the availability until like, you know, basically the Monday after spring break so that you have plenty of time to do it. All right, so any questions administratively moving forward? Uh, as it mentioned at the end of stage two, you should start thinking about, um, you know, a, a proposal for what you want to do for your kind of creative project. We've now seen enough systems that I'm hoping it kind of gives you an idea of like, how can I demonstrate a concept or how can I come up with a catalog of like, for example, um, you could, you know, take that assignment one that we did where you went around ASU campus and you found one particular, um, something you could describe with a causal loop diagram, and you could say, well, maybe I'll pick um, five of the systems archetypes, the, the, the big ones that we learned, 
and I'll find kind of examples of each one of those and I'll bundle them into kind of a document where I do kind of like assignment B1 where I say, um, here's an example, here's the system, here are the variables, here's the diagram um, abstractly, um, and here's the diagram concretely with relates to this system, and here are the potential traps that this suggests for this real system. If I do that for like five different ones and bundle them together, then that would be a great way to show um, examples of these archetypes. So that would be like a great creative project. So you could use something like that to come up with something on your own. Um, so uh, of course the class isn't over. And so you might propose something and then we learn about something later that really gets you more excited and you wanna change things up and that's totally fine. Or I think at the point where you could start thinking about what you wanna do for that term creative project and you can do about anything except for a lecture. So I don't want you to just basically repeat what I've been doing, uh, but you can use PowerPoint to, to create like a prompt for something. I mean, that would be totally fine. So you could use um, materials like that, that you could create using productivity tools, uh, but I just don't want you to give a lecture on a topic. I want you to do something a little more creative than that. Um, but you know, it, it, it could still involve you, you know, being in front of a camera on Zoom. Um, you know, it could be a TikTok style video um, that is exhibiting some concept we've discussed or so on and so forth. So just get some thought to it. And as I said in the, I think it's, uh, it's not the, I think you have at least a week after spring break to submit that. Um, I think it's the end of that week, if not the week after that. Um, I put it on the midterm and it should already be on your calendars. And if you want more information about it, those assignments are populated on Canvas. So any questions about any of that? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the midterm. Uh -huh. Did the class score, like how you were anticipating it, uh, like us to do? Uh, I would say pretty much so. I, the, I mean, this is the first time I had to build a midterm for this class. So it was a little lower than I expected. That's why I kind of curved it up. But um, it generally was about what I was shooting for, and the, and the spread was about what I, I liked. And so, um, so I was, I didn't, I, I thought it was, it was fine from my perspective. And I thought that the improvement from stage one to stage two was pretty good. And I, and uh, I thought that, I mean, just sitting here listening to those of you who came and did stage two here is quite a bit of group. Um, I, I really like to hear those conversations were very good to me. I felt like a lot of there were a lot of misconceptions that were corrected and a lot of really awesome discussions. And I thought that if you look at the improvements um, from my view, from the averages and things from stage one to stage two, um, there was a lot of good work that was done there uh, that you all did, you know, by yourselves with each other. And that was kind of the goal. And so I was very happy with that outcome. So if the stage two looked exactly like the stage one, then that would tell me that, you know, there's some major problems here, but because stage two, stage one was a little lower but then stage two was about where I wanted it to be, then it showed that um, any issues that didn't quite sink in for stage one were easily corrected just with you guys talking to each other. And that's where I wanted to be. So any other questions? So it's going to be a write down proposal yes. to soon. Yeah. So the creative project, um, I was thinking of doing like a painting or drawing or something mm -hmm. for mine. Yep. Um, when you like, would it just be drawing a system or would it be like drawing a diagram of a system? I would say pitch it uh, in your proposal. It, it, it needs to be sort of, uh, I mean, the, the goal is for you to demonstrate a kind of a mastery of a topic or topics in this course. And that might mean that I'm gonna depict a diagram of a system in a particular way, or that might mean that I'm gonna depict a system in a particular way that makes its um, dynamics more evident. So, you know, maybe if I just, um, you know, if I separate out the layers of an image, I start being able to see the interconnections better and you can depict that graphically. That would be one way to do it. Um, but yeah, it's really up to you. It's, you know, it's uh, very open-ended. Yeah. So would we be able to 
take, let's say, an example of like, like let's say we took a CLD that was already created online uh -huh. and we documented that in pictures and something in that. Would that, or do you want us to create our own? Like, well, I mean, so if you're talking about CLDs for your own system architects, I, again, I, I put in your proposal, but the idea would be like, if you found like, Here's, for example, we didn't talk about some system archetypes like uh, there's one called accidental adversaries. It's another popular, but more complex system archetype. You can say, I found this cool archetype, accidental adversaries, um, and we didn't talk about that in class. Um, and so in my creative project, I, um, I mean, maybe you just do a write-up on accidental adversaries, like, you know, four-page write-up where you've got the CLD, and you say, here's the general problem and here's the more specific case. Uh, or you want to do something a little bit more artistic and you um, say, well, I am going to demonstrate accidental adversaries and I'll put the CLD up, but then maybe I'll have pictures all around the CLD that'll kind of um, explain uh, the different components uh, and how they're interacting. So accidental adversaries, for example, if you were to look that one up, a lot of people use dueling showers as an example of it. So in axial adversaries, it's kind of like this process, this kind of escalation-like process where you've got these two balancing loops that are fighting, but there ends up being this um, reinforcing loop in between them, which actually makes the fight stronger and stronger and stronger over time. That's what turns into these axial adversaries. So you can imagine putting, um, you know, images from that shower system around or maybe behavior over time, and you know, showing like where each component sort of like if you had a sample behavior over time, where you know, who has sort of the advantage and, and that sort of. I mean, I don't know. I mean, these are all. Um, there's no right answer to that, but yeah, I just want you to sort of say, uh, imagine if after this class, someone starting this class was trying to really better understand some topic. Um, how could you do something other than the kind of conventional stuff that I do that would really speak to that person coming into the class? Any other questions, clarifications? And if you'd rather do a more conventional term paper or something, that's fine. Um, you know, I wouldn't say like shoot for a 20 page term paper or whatever, more like you know, a four page write up or something that would be kind of um, on par with what I'd be looking for. Um, but if you'd also want to write something, but you don't want it to write it kind of in that style, um, even a short story or something, uh, you know, a fic like something fictional um, would also be fine. Um, so there's a lot of different things. You can even build a 3D model with something. Uh, maybe it's actually got some dynamics. So it's like a Rube Goldberg machine or uh, something like a pendulum that you swing out. And as it's swinging through, it goes through certain patterns, and you take a video of that, and you sort of say this shows this particular property of a dynamical system. It could not be system archetypes related; it could be stability related. So here's a system that, if I push it a little bit, it swings a particular way. But if I push it a little harder, then it starts moving into a different behavior entirely, and it takes on that behavior, showing demonstrating stability regimes. So you know that's another kind of. All right, well, I'm looking forward to that. Um, okay. So, uh, so we're moving now in this unit F um, is th this unit, I think I called um, advanced resilience thinking. So it's sort of taking what we know about resilience and combining it with some of the other topics that we've seen um, in order to sort of think about larger patterns in resilience. And, um, and in particular, uh, what I'm focusing on in this unit is thinking about um, longer scale patterns. So, you know, how does resilience itself change over time? So um, we're thinking about like, you know, we've got these large systems have many components. And there they can that can change over time. And when we've talked about change over time, we've been talking about um, changes like you can have changes in macro state over time, but then for every macro state, there could be changes in micro state 
underneath that. So as kind of an example, um, you know, we've if we talk about uh, population growth, for example. So we know with population growth, we often get patterns that look like this, where you reach some carrying capacity over time. And this reflects the archetype limits to growth. Um, but every population size is like a macro state that corresponds to a bunch of different ways that population could be structured. So we can think about here that maybe the macro states is population size, but the micro states is the distribution of reproductive success over individuals. So what do I mean by that? Um, I mean, like, you can imagine that if you were sitting at carrying capacity, which is like whatever, 2,000 fish in a fishery, then you can ask, um, okay, for every um, fish that can make, that is of reproductive age, what's their share of reproduction for the next generation? Is it equal across all the fish? Are all the fish reproducing equally? Or is there one fish or two fish or three fish that somehow are just dominating um, all of the reproduction so that all the rest hardly get any? And from the macro state point of view, those both might look equal, you know, equivalent because they're both producing carrying capacity. But the micro state, it's a very different structure of the population. And it might be that one of them is somehow more resilient than another. Or in other words, um, if, if you're in the state where one fish is doing all the reproducing, then if that one fish dies, then you can get a massive collapse in the macro state. But, um, but if all of the fish are reproducing equally, then if any fish dies, you might get fluctuations in the macro state, but you're never gonna get a massive collapse in the population. So that suggests that over longer time scales, the things that we could observe um, are sort of just surface levels and really, you know, the tip of the iceberg, there's a lot of the dynamics that are unobservable that's going on underneath that. And those could change over time. You could say that initially when you hit carrying capacity, all fish are reproducing equally, but over time, somehow one fish or two fish become the most efficient reproducers and they just dominate all of reproduction. And so even though at the macro state, it looks like the population has been steady, underneath it all in the micro state, then the population is changing how everything's allocated. So that over long periods of time, it's really a fundamentally different system. And so that's why uh, we're really interested in thinking about now these longer term changes in systems that might uh, tell us more about how their resilience changes over time. So resilience is now less of a static property. Like we've talked about exogenous variables causing changes in resilience. We've talked about shocks causing changes in resilience. But we haven't really talked about endogenous dynamics causing resilience to change over time naturally. And that's what we're getting at in this section is that um, resilience doesn't need an external shock to change. Um, there can be natural changes in resilience that just happen as the system restructures itself, um, even though it has no forces, uh, external forcing it to restructure itself. That's kind of what we're getting into now. <coughs> so any questions or responses to that? Or that, does that example make sense? Maybe it'll be a little more concrete if I kind of go back to the economic example that we sort of ended on um, before the midterm. So like one, you know, rather than worry about fish, let's bring it a little bit closer. So like the first example I want to give goes back to 
back to what we talked about before the midterm wealth distributions in societies. Now, before I talk about or we get into like how result how these um, how these system properties like resilience might change over time, we have to first sort of assess like how we measure the health or the state of the system at any one time. And so we can sort of try to you know ask you know, questions about how do we measure the sort of health of a distribution, health of a wealth distribution. So what do I mean by wealth distributions? So um, if I were to plot out, let's say, and this is again going back to like where we were talking about before the midterm, if I had dollars per person here and frequency here, then there's a bunch of different ways. Like I could say the total amount of wealth, so the total wealth. Is some value t, and we can call that a macro state. But there are a bunch of different ways that we all can have t dollars, and we can then talk about the different distributions of that. So um, we might all have roughly the same amount of money. So this is um, in this distribution, um, everyone has roughly the same amount of money. Or alternatively, we could imagine um, a, a different distribution, say like this one, which is more like an exponential. And in this distribution, then there are um, many people with little money and a few with a lot of money, like much money. And notice that in both of these cases, um, the area under curve under these curves um, are the same or at least imagine that they are the same and that's because they both come from the same macro state so it's like the, there's t dollars like the same amount of money is under both curves but we've stretched it out differently we've taken that play-doh that is the T dollars. And we've either, you know, stretched it up so that it's all in one place. We all have, you know, hundred dollars in our pockets or we've stretched it out so that some people have um, uh, nearly all the money and um, a, a lot of people have very little money. So um, there is a lot of money that is combined in this population. So if you were to take, uh, the thousand people that all have very little money and pool all their money, that would be a lot. But no one of them would have a lot of money. But there is uh, like a couple of people out here that individually have a lot of money, um, but there's just very few of them. So a lot of people with little money or very few people um, with a lot of money. Yes. So, like the sample size is the same situations, right? Yeah, you think of the same number of people and the same total amount of money. But just a different way to distribute the money across. And so if we look at you know macroeconomics, like total amount of money in the economy, um, both of these look the same. But at the sort of micro state level, um, we might think that one of these is sort of healthier than the other. Um, and so we might want to be able to sort of address uh, this idea that of the sort of um, you know, the healthy distribution and how far we are away from the healthy distribution. So we might, you know, I think a, a common um, assumption is that, you know, it's a, a healthy distribution 
is the sort of um, uh, where everyone has an equal amount of money. So I'll say the kind of egalitarian or, um, you know, I don't know, equitable or equal, whatever you want to call it. So equal money case, which is, you know, sort of um, more like, you know, this is most similar. So that's great. In principle, we can say, wouldn't it be great if everybody had the same amount of money? But what it would be nice to know is how far off, like, is there a way for us to say um, conclusively that this kind of spiky peak is definitely closer than this purple one? Is there like a metric that we can use to measure the distance from equality? And maybe that metric, if we have a way to measure it, um, will help us in sort of saying what type of intervention we might need to make in a system or not. So um, how do we get to that sort of measure? Well, what the economists use um, is something called a Lorenz curve. And so we look at wealth distributions in societies, then um, one way that you can alternatively plot them is with this thing called a Lorenz curve. And so what a Lorenz curve does is um, we're going to take Imagine um, sorting, so sort every individual by wealth. So rank them. So rank one would be poorest, and uh, rank n for n individuals would be richest. Is for n individuals. And then we can sort of assign them a score from zero to one, just basically divide by n. So you can uh, divide the rank by n to give a score from zero to one. So if my score is zero, I'm the poorest person in the economy. Um, if my score is one, I'm the richest person in the economy. Um, and then um, for every person in the ranking, I can ask the question, uh, how much money, how much money uh, is tied up in a person and everyone poorer than that? So I might have $10 in my pocket and I'm in rank 10. Well, I can then go and ask rank nine, eight, seven, six, all the way down to one, how much money they have in their pockets and add all that up together. And I can plot those two things together and that's what the Lorenz curve is. And so um, if I were to put down here, the axis, and this is a uh, rank, or I'll say score. So it goes from zero to one. And this up here, and I just want to make sure I get the scaling right here. But I'm going to move this a little bit so I can make it linear. But I mean, the general shape is what matters. The actual scale here probably is not working. Four. So I'm going to actually put one here. Right, and then over here, this axis on the left here is the proportion of money accounted for for someone at that rank or lower. So this is the proportion of total wealth. 
for someone, I would say for, um, for that, for that score and all lower. All right, so what do I mean by that? Well, in the equality case, I would get a line like this. So this is an equal wealth distribution. And so what that means is that uh, the person who is in the equal wealth distribution, we all have the same amount of money. So um, <clears throat> if you ask, Anyone, so it doesn't matter how we're ranked. So we just arbitrarily rank ourselves because we're all the same. And then what this line is representing is basically how far we are along the ranking. So if we all lined up so that technically the poorest person is here and the richest person is there, but because we all have the same amount of money, we all have the same amount of money. It doesn't matter how we're ordered. But in theory, the poorest person here, the richest person there, then as we walk from uh, this point to this point, what we're doing was asking, how much money do you have? Okay, how much money do you and you have? How much money do you, you, and you have? And so on. And as we go farther down this axis, we're talking to different people in this ordering, in this ranking. And we're asking how much money is from your point to the right, your point to the right. And it climbs, and if we all have an equal amount of money, it's going to rise along this line. So that by the time we get all the way over there to the lectern, we account for all of the money in the society, in our group, um, so that 100% of the wealth will be at the person at the lectern or everyone to the right of them. Um, and that's how we get this line here. That's what the equal wealth distribution looks like. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. So the order is strategic then, right, of people? Well, it's not, um, well, it's, it, 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 this isn't like a game for each person, like where they're placed. This is just a way that we are uh, plotting the wealth distribution that I'm, that I'm, that I, I'm just claiming that in a moment here will allow us to measure uh, the distance from equality. And so, uh, so the Lorenz curve is just an alternative way, like the fact here, this is one way to plot wealth distributions, where here I can say, how much money does everybody have, and how frequent is that amount? This is an alternative way to plot the same data. So I'm plotting cumulative wealth here, and cumulative kind of ranking here against each other. So yeah, so if you're if you're at fifty percent, like so you're in the middle of the society, and half of the society is richer than you, and half of the society is poorer than you, then you'd say, well, <clears throat> how much money is tied up in you and everyone poorer than you? Well, if we're all equal, then if I'm at fifty percent here, I should be at fifty percent here. I see. So that's, it's like that's right. It's like a, a percentile uh, in the ranking and a percentile in the total wealth and how they match up. Does that make sense so far? So an equal wealth distribution, my rank um, should be directly proportional to how much money is tied up with me and everybody for it. That makes sense, because we're going to have to go step slightly more advanced, but then think about other distributions. Yeah. So this is like comparable to when you're like a little kid and they tell you that you're in the 30th percentile, like height or weight wise. That means you're like 30 percent taller than people below you. That's where this score comes from. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's the quantile there. That's right. So yeah, so but then you could then then extend that and say if we know everybody's percentile, like percentile weight or whatever, then we can sort of say, um, then we can say, but what weight does that correspond to? You know, and that kind of will then give you an idea that if you plot like that Lorenz curve, then you can sort of see that, okay, um, is it an equal weight distribution? Like, are we all the same weight? Or if there's some people who are really heavy and some people who are really light. And that would change the way this curve looked. So this would assume that, that, yeah, you might be in the 80th percentile, but if you're all equal weight, then it's not that meaningful to say you're in the 80th percentile because uh, that means that 80% of sort of the total weight in the biomass of your class is you and everyone. But if 
there's one person who's really heavy and everybody else is really light, then you being in the 80th percentile <clears throat> uh, might mean you're 80th in the ranking, but still most of the weight is above you because it's tied up in one other person. So that's what gets to the, um, say, all right, well then, um, realistic distributions are actually hang underneath this. So um, you might have an exponential distribution <laughs> might look like this. And so that curve hangs down there because what it's saying is that if you rank all the poorest people on uh, on this side, so this is all the poorest people, and the richest people over here, then <clears throat> as you start walking down through the poorest people who are all lined up here, they don't add much to the wealth as you keep adding the money. So how much money do you have? All right, how much do you have? I add those together. How much do you have? I add those together. And so you get a slow rise in your accumulated the total. Then at some point, you hit a few people towards the end who have a lot of money and you get a big jump. And that's the reason why this curve stays low and then jumps up. So in the worst case distribution, um, like where one person has all the money and everybody else has zero dollars, it would look like this. It would basically be flat and then at the last second jump up to 100%. Yeah. So is the Lorenz curve like a visual way of seeing the standard deviation of a data set? It sees the standard deviation, but more even like the shape. Like it covers what we would say higher moments as well, skew, um, all sorts of things. It really captures um, how um, wealth is truly shaped through the entire population. Yeah. So it's sort of like the integral, right? Um, like, because the, um, the space underneath is... Well, we're getting the space underneath here in a second, but the, I would say that these cumulative are related. It's almost like plotting one type of integral against another type of integral, because we're sort of saying that it's kind of like the integral of rank, or something, or like rank is sort of like, um, you know, it's a position in society. Or I can say that. It's, it's, it's rank against the integral here, where this integral is sort of like, um, what's the area underneath the wealth curve up to that rank is sort of what's being plotted. So, yeah, that we, when we call it cumulative wealth, but the mathematical operation you actually use to calculate that does happen to be an interval. Um, so, or I guess what, you, like, this is just like a visual representation of the curve. Right. And, right. So, well, basically, every one of these curves. That you could draw here. Maybe it looks um, more like a bell curve. Maybe it's really spiky. Uh, maybe it, it's bimodal. Um, every one of these curves that you could draw in this space, you can represent as a curve in this space. It would look different, but so it's a, an alternative visualization that is built up here just to sort of give us a tool to measure basically this gap in between. Um, every because every distribution will hang underneath this distribution, and the amount of space in between the equality distribution and this distribution is what's going to give us a measure of how far a wealth distribution is from our sort of healthy equal distribution case. And that's something called the Gini index, which I'm about to add to this discussion. But I want to make sure everybody feels roughly okay with this visualization. Okay, so um, if we look at this, um, I can, I'm gonna, just gonna drop a line here, a dashed line, and say that um, if we wanted to measure how far away a wealth distribution was from our egalitarian or equal wealth case, one way to do that would just be to take the area underneath this curve divided by the total area in this triangle. And so I'm just going to call, I'll highlight this area up here. Um, 
scribbling this somewhat in. I'll highlight this area down here. I'll call this area A. And I'll call this area down here B. And there's this thing called the Gini index, or some people call it the Gini coefficient. And that is equal to A divided by A plus B. So that's, I can highlight that A is the yellow stuff, and A plus B is that. So basically, um, if you just think here, this is the triangle. And if you think about it, this A plus B is always going to be equal to 0.5. So I'll just say A plus B is equal to 0.5. Um, because this is just a square. And it has one on one side and the other on the other side. And so half of the square has got an area of 0.5. But when we justify where the 0.5 comes from, then we say, well, it's the if since all the curves live in this bottom half of the triangle, we're just we're saying normalizing by the size of that triangle. So really what the Gini coefficient is is the size of how much this droop is. But they just happen to conventionally divided by 0.5, which is the area of this total triangle. That's what we call the Gini coefficient. And so as I'll write down here in a second, but I'm gonna give you a chance to sort of sit and look at this. The Gini coefficient for the equal wealth distribution, well, how much, well, let me just ask you, what would the Gini coefficient be for the equal wealth distribution? Any guesses? Zero. Zero. That's right. Why would it be zero? No distance between the curves. No distance between the curves. And that makes sense because the Gini coefficient um, is supposed to represent the distance from equality. So if you're already at equality, the distance to equality should be zero. So if you're measuring the Gini coefficient of the red line, <coughs> there is no droop at all. So it is going to be zero divided by 0.5, which is zero. But we can also measure the Gini coefficients of other distributions. And the exponential distribution happens to have a Gini coefficient of 0.5. And so that means that if you use our econophysics um, you know, discussion from before the midterm, if we, we can measure this, we measure this in the United States, we can measure this in the UK, we can measure this in China, we measure this in Russia, we can measure this thing. And we would expect that the sort of natural behavior of economies would be to go to Gini coefficients that are 0.5. And as governments step in and manipulate their economy in one way or the other, we should see shifts away from 0.5 um, either above or below. So um, above 0.5 is going to represent concentration of money in a few. Below 0.5 will mean redistributing money among many. And so we can look at that data. So I'll just pull that up here. So I'll just write up here, by the way, uh, Gini index for equality is equal to zero Gini index for an exponential which, if you remember, I also said was called the Boltzmann distribution, um, is equal to 0.5. And if I go over, and I had already done, I'm just going to pull up a copy here of a graph. And so when I upload my instructor notes, it's supposed to be up there. But I just want to paste it in here for us to look at. So these are the Gini indices for a bunch of different countries um, since uh, before 1950. And um, so uh, I can just highlight here the United States and China. Uh, the United States is this yellow line. China is this red line. Here's Mexico, the green line up here, Brazil up here, 
And they uh, they are doing their QD index um, in terms of 100. So instead of being from zero to one, they just made it from zero to 100. So that means that um, the exponential baseline is right here. So that is the exponential. So that's kind of the, the maximum entropy distribution. That's like uh, the natural behavior of the system. And so you can see that most of these developed countries have got a Gini coefficient of around say 0.3. So developed countries um, is around say 0.35 or something like that. Around 0 0.35. Um, but you can see some countries like Brazil have a Gini coefficient that's much higher at 0.6. What's that saying is that in Brazil, they have concentrated more wealth into fewer people, more than you'd expect from just natural economic behavior. What it's saying down here is that most of these developed countries, they've done the opposite. They've actually reduced the concentration of wealth in, uh, in a few people by more than you'd expect by random chance alone. So this red line is by random chance. If we were just randomly trading money, this is where we would let, uh, land at 0.5. So one might guess that wealth redistribution programs in these developed countries have taxed you know, rich people and brought the wealth back to poorer people. And that's the reason why uh, the Gini coefficient is lower. And one might guess that some other corruption or something else that's happening in countries up here um, would end up um, shifting the GD coefficient to higher levels, thus concentrating wealth in a very few. Um, and then you can also see like the United States, it starts down here and then it, it moves up toward 0.5. And you might say that that suggests um, that from say 1980 and on, so around the time Ronald Reagan became president, that the United States has become uh, more and more um, you know, free market, and um, and that you know so that's what this number is very interesting, and in that it, it's this interesting kind of like temperature gauge that really reflects. Uh, you know, some aspect of policies that are going on in these different countries. And that is all captured uh, by plotting the Lorentz curve or the wealth distributions and calculating this Gini coefficient. So, are there questions about that? See how we can use the Gini coefficient to assess the health of wealth distributions in these systems. Make sense. And so, just as a reminder, um, if we, if the government backed out, what the econophysics would suggest is that the um, natural behavior of the system would be to either descend to 0.5 or rise to 0.5. Um, and by government, I could mean just any. Um, any, uh, you know, when you're doing work on a system, so there is some entity that is actively moving the system around as opposed to just letting it naturally uh, come to settle. And so the settling point for a Gini coefficient is around 0.5. And so when you do work on the system, you can hold it away from 0.5, but you have to constantly do that work, which is like constant taxation, um, or it is away from uh, 0.5 which also might be um, constant taxation, but the taxation doesn't get redistributed. It's going to one person. So that's one example of an indicator of system health. Now, when you look at this, you'd say, um, well, let's say I wanna design policies for these systems um, how do I go about doing that? Because in a country, uh, you're going to have different people will have different agendas. Every policy is going to affect some people differently. 
if I tax the rich, that might be good for the poor, but it's bad for the rich. And you know, the rich aren't necessarily bad people um, and vice versa. So it becomes very difficult for us to think about developing policy. And, um, and so that brings up the next thing is that when we're thinking about health and intervening in policies, um, I wanna introduce this, this topic of, um, well, for one, of, of social welfare, so social welfare policy. And so I'm not going to get very much into this, uh, but this is sort of a preview to courses like SOS 325, where you get into this in far more detail. But I do want to introduce this topic of what we refer to as Pareto optimality. And that will allow us to also connect back to ecologies, which ultimately is where I might want to end here, which will set up for these readings. All right, so. Um, if we have multiple groups in a society um, that have different interests, so if we think about policy changes that we could make um, as policymakers, then we could imagine that it might benefit some, it might not benefit others, it might benefit all simultaneously. And so if we have to say, well, how do we decide which policies to pick? How do we decide what tax rate to choose? How do we also decide which uh, products are taxed and which aren't? And so on and so forth. Well, um, it's oftentimes we just want like one optimization function to say like, what is best for the society? But there really is no one best for society. There's things that are good for some, but bad for others. Um, and then there hopefully are things that are good for everyone. And hopefully we take those movements. And that is what's being captured by this thing called Pareto optimality. So um, the, the basic idea here is rather than thinking about a society as having one objective, we think about multiple objectives simultaneously. So we can say that um, that there is uh, a utility for party one, or I'll say party A in a society. And then there's also a utility for party B in a society. So party A might be all of the people who own companies. Party B might be all the people who work for those companies. And we can think about, um, you know, there are, are different configurations of a society that will bring different amount of utility. So there is some state of a society that will bring a certain amount of utility to the workers and a certain amount of utility to the employers. And if we say as a government uh, are trying to figure out whether, you know, how to make a change, ideally we would like to make changes that move things in a positive direction for both. And so if I move things from here to here, I make things better for the workers and for the employers simultaneously. That idea of finding something that's better, best for all parties is what's called a Pareto improvement. So a Pareto improvement is a change that is better for all simultaneously. And a, a good policymaker will only make Pareto improvements in, in principle. So they might make that Pareto improvement and then they figure out that they can make another Pareto improvement that maybe lands here. Now, eventually, this process has to end. Eventually, you get to a point where you've, you've squeezed out all of the possible improvements you can make that don't cause one party to increase without requiring another party to compromise. And so if I were to plot all of the possible configurations of a society, it would basically be in this bottom left half. And there would be a set of configurations on the barrier here. 
maybe draw um, a dotted line kind of through that set. And basically, um, everything up here would be inaccessible. There's just no way for employers and employees to ever live, live, live up here. The only way for employees to have this much benefit is for employers to have this little bit. That's what it's sort of saying here. So this represents a fundamental trade-off between them. And that edge, this edge here, we call the Pareto frontier. It represents the eventual trade-off between parties. So as a policymaker, your job is to kind of get things to the Pareto frontier. Then it's a much more complicated uh, discussion to say, well, how do we move along the Pareto frontier? Because that's really where the hard decisions are. Because now you're getting to the point where you're saying, the only way to make it better for one group is to make it worse for another group. And so then we have to ask, um, you know, when is it warranted? How much, uh, when do we get to the point where we make it so much better for one group that it is warranted to make it a little bit worse for another group? And that's a hard question to ask, but those are the types, the solutions to that problem are the types of things that you talk about in 325, so in future classes. But I just want you to sort of see this basic idea that when you start out, you find things that are win-win situations, you know, so the Pareto improvement is a so-called win-win situation. You know, or sometimes I hear about these like, you know, the, the, the um, well, I won't get into the, all the kind of lingo here, but, but yeah, when you look for things that are better for everybody, um, that's what you would, you would prefer. And Pareto improvements is the technical term we have for that. Um, but eventually all Pareto improvements, you get to the point where there will be a conservative limitation. So, um, you know, that eventually limitations, eventually, remove ability for further improvement. Now, um, we, can, we can talk about this in terms of what we do as policymakers, but we also can talk about this in terms of what we do to advise policymakers. So um, I work on a bunch of projects where um, let's say we're trying to figure out where to put wetlands in the Texas Brazos River Valley. So it's a project that I work on. Um, and the different places you can put wetlands may actually improve uh, the flood uh, tolerance for certain areas, but they might um, make it harder to be tolerant to drought in other areas. And so we have to say, well, where we put, if we're on a fixed budget, where we can put these wetlands, we either, uh, like if we can add a wetland that makes it better in terms of both flood and drought, we should do that, we should keep doing that. But eventually we're gonna figure out a set of ways we can put wetlands where if we, if we configure the wetlands down here, uh, it'll make it great in terms of flood for some, but it's gonna make it awful in terms of drought for others. Or we can put wetlands up here and it'll do the opposite, make it great in terms of drought for some, make it awful in terms of flood for others. It is our job in developing these tools for our uh, interested parties to get rid of all of these obvious uh, answers. Because all of these, if you pick one of these wetland configurations, there's always a wetland configuration that is objectively better for all parties. So we try to identify all of the mini wetland configurations that have a Pareto improvement coming out of them. And instead, we give our decision makers this frontier. Here are all of the possible ways that you could arrange wetlands in Texas that would trade off among these things. And then I'm gonna let you, decision maker, use some other subjective policy, politics, whatever, economics, to then decide where you wanna be along this point. But I can guarantee you that you're not gonna choose a wetland configuration 
that doesn't, that you're not gonna regret later because there was a win-win alternative. Um, so it's a way of sort of saying um, uh, a regret-free choice will be a choice along the trade-off because there's, that no one's ever gonna come back to you and say, you wasted all this money. If you would have just put the wetlands over there, everyone would have been happier. If you choose a wetland configuration on this trade-off frontier, um, it always will be the case that if you would have chosen another point anywhere else, um, yeah, it might have made it better for someone, but it would have made it worse for someone else. And that helps you justify why you chose one point over another. So that's another way that we use this multi-objective framework. We don't look for single objective ways. There's, we don't just optimize. There's no way to say what is the best. There is no best when you set policy. There's only good for some and crappy for others. So our job as policymakers is to figure out how to wade through the good and the crap. And the way we do that is providing uh, sets of alternatives so that human decision makers can figure out where they want to be within those sets. So any questions about this framework, about thinking about multiple objectives simultaneously and the trade-off space between them? Yeah. Um, just a small question. So utility is referring to money or just like the ability to... So utility is referring to, uh, I mean, it, 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 you can often measure it in money, but it's generally how much are you willing to give up? So. You might say that uh, if you put the wetland there, I'm willing to give up um, my own, like I'm willing to give up land uh, that I was using for farming to put a wetland there because that wetland there is gonna be more beneficial to me. So somehow um, it's hard to then say, well, what you, how can we measure utility? And often the survey data, but and it's often usually like we can, we will put it in terms of dollars, but, it may not actually represent real dollars being handled. It's just, what's it worth to you? Yeah, it's value. I'd say the value to party A, the value to party B. Any other questions about that? <coughs> All right, well, I'm gonna close here where I'm gonna transport us from thinking of this in the policy space to thinking about um, natural ecosystems and how they structure themselves and how it relates to this. And so, and that kind of sets up for these readings. And so the, um, in, in ecology or in biology, or I should say, there likewise is no one right way to be a living organism. There are performance criteria. Um, that differ. So I could have performance criteria A and performance criteria B. For example, this could be like speed, and this could be like ability to um, ingest toxins or something like that. So ideally, it would be great if I was fast and I could eat a bunch of toxins. Um, and so, um, I, if there was a species that had a little bit of speed and a little bit of ability to ingest toxins, if there came around a um, you know offspring of that organism that could do both better, then that offspring probably would end up having even more offspring itself, and we might expect that that species would evolve adaptations that are going to do both of these things better. So likewise, just, uh, just like what we want to do if we're intentionally designing things, what natural selection does is natural selection, which we'll talk a little bit later in a future unit here, doesn't optimize in a one criteria sense. It thinks of, it, it takes multiple ways that you can be better at things. And it basically moves things toward the Pareto frontier of those. So um, just like in my picture before, if you've got ways to be better in these different performance criteria, eventually you reach a limitation where you reach a Pareto frontier. Where at this point, the only way you can get better in one uh, thing, in one trait, is by giving up on another. And so the only way you can get faster 
might be is you lose the ability to ingest toxins. And that's like a weird trade off, but it might be like the only way you can get faster is to lose your ability to be camouflaged. The only way that you can be sufficiently camouflaged against predators is to also uh, become much slower um, in those sorts of things. And so natural trade offs, limitations um, eventually emerge, which means that um, natural selection moves organisms toward this trade off space. So natural selection is not optimizing one particular thing. You know, I am not, you know, the optimal organism uh, because I've been around because of I've come. It's because three point eight billion years of evolution have led me. To it. Um, instead, I am one example of a um, an individual on this Pareto frontier, on this trade off space, and we refer to the to all of the individuals on the Pareto frontier as an ecological community. And so these uh, communities coexist by separating into niches, niches. In a niche, that this is like a niche. A niche is a particular uh, trade off or segment of the frontier. So we're talking about niches, we're saying that, oh, your niche is the speed niche, my niche is the toxicity niche. Um, and so we both coexist. Because you can be fast, um, but I can eat these toxins and be slow. And so um, that separation allows us to kind of never get in each other's way. So natural selection creates diverse communities. And so uh, you know, diversity equals many niches. And so we're not going to get to it here, but the only other note that I want to mention here, and I was going to go into more detail on this, is that a measure of diversity, of biodiversity, is Shannon entropy, um, or what uh, ecologists often call the Shannon index. And maybe next time um, I'll pick up there just to so we see exactly how you can look at a sample of data and calculate a, uh, a Shannon index of it to sort of say, is this diverse or not? Uh, but we'll then after that focus on the chapter and this will relate to um, the cycles that we talked about in that chapter. So I don't want to keep any longer than that, but um, I will put up the attendance slide. So the attendance slide here um, is, um, Uh, we'll say, oh, what is the Gini index of an equal wealth distribution? What's the Gini coefficient? What number value, what numerical value is the Gini index for an equal wealth distribution? And otherwise, I hope you guys have a great spring break. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back next um, afterwards. And just remember there's a reading on Tuesday, um, and I'll have some of the assignments uh, done here soon. So you've got those to mull over. Yeah, you had the slide before the last one. Uh, can I bring it back up? Um, I tried. Put it here? Yeah. Thank you.